Okay, I guess uh, we can start. So the next speaker is Richard Thomas from Imperial College, and he will speak about buffer width and invariance for projective surface. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's nice you still invite us non-Europeans, ex-Europeans. Uh, I appreciate in future you have to, maybe you could invite some Icelanders or some in our place. Uh, okay, so I should, I should say I'm not going to say anything, I think, that physicists don't already know. But um, I'm sure you're familiar with talking to mathematicians and they say, what's the definition? So somehow this, this talk is about giving a definition. So mathematicians are more likely to get into this area and work in this area if they have a definition, which until now we haven't had. So th this talks to give a definition, and then I'll talk about some, I'll talk briefly about some calculations at the end. Okay, so everything's about this slide here, this, uh, and the next one, the, mo the model, the local model, and then I'll explain how it all fits in uh, in various different situations. And um, I learned about this model uh, on the next slide from Vafram Witten, I believe it goes back to maybe Matai Quillen or Atiyah Jeffrey or many physicists, uh, Blau Thompson, various people, but I don't really know the history. But I, I learned it all from Vafram Witten. And Vafram Witten have a nonlinear version of the model I'm going to explain, but then I'll explain how we get rid of that nonlinearity. Okay, so um, the, the setup in moduli problems always of this form. So we have some moduli space cut out of some ambient space, so A is for ambient, M is for moduli, by a section of a vector bundle. And this, this occurs in a real setting or a complex setting, in an infinite dimensional setting or a finite dimensional setting. So the two cases I'm interested in is it's going to be an infinite dimensional setting in gauge theory, a real infinite dimensional setting, and that's this. So you would have the anti-self-dual moduli space of anti-self-dual connections cut out of the space of all connections by uh, this self-dual two-form. Okay, so uh, you have over any connection, you can take a, a section, a point in, a, in an infinite dimensional vector space, which is the sections of self-dual two-forms with values in the adjoint bundle, and you take this section, and where it's zero, you get the anti-self-dual moduli space. And then in gray, you have to deal with gauge, so either you can deal with gauge here, you can divide the connections by gauge, or you can try and deal with gauge by fixing the gauge by some Coulomb gauge condition. Okay, so either, either will do. But, so that's some global model. So I call it a local model. That's some glo more or less global model up to this gauge issue. That's some global model for this moduli space. And then uh, where I'll be interested in, because I'm an algebraic geometer, is in complex situations where this is really a local finite dimensional model. So lo even though globally you have this situation, um, locally, because this section's Fred Ohm, you can cut everything down by taking slices to a finite dimensional local model. You can't do that globally, but you can do it finite dimensionally and locally. And in the situations I'm interested in, there'll actually be a holomorphic section and everything will be complex. But we'll come to that later. All right? And then we get this moduli space of the zeros of the section, and it has a virtual dimension, which I forgot to write down, which is sort of the, the number of unknowns minus the number of equations. So the, the dimension of A minus the rank of E. And in the infinite dimensional setting, that's meant in some Fred Holm sense. All right, so that's the local model. And then what do we do to it? So this is the important part of the talk, is we replace this local model here by a bigger model. All right, and it's just the fact that a section of a vector bundle is the same thing as a linear function on the total space of the dual vector bundle. All right, so just thinking of a section point-wise, over any point of A, just an element of a vector space is a linear function on the dual vector space. All right, so this section is equivalent to this function on the dual vector space. Okay, sorry, that's not R mod C, that's, yeah. <laughs> We're either in the real case or the complex case. All right, so we have this, this, this setup here, this data of a section of a vector bundle is the same thing as a function on this bigger ambient space, which is the dual vector bundle. And that's what I'm going to call a tilde. So this is this bigger ambient space. And now we don't consider the zeros of this section, but we consider its gradient. 
and we take the zeros of that. So we're interested in the critical points of this function here. All right. So I think most people are from LG models or something. Most people are familiar with this kind of construction. All right. So we're going to replace a section of a vector bundle by critical points of the associated function on the bigger space. So this is linear. This has certain obvious linearities, linear up the fibers. All right. And the Waffer Witten equations won't quite have that property, but they will when we do something to them. We pass them through. Um, we solve some moment map equation. All right, so uh, I, I'm dwelling on this. I know it's very elementary, but this is the key to everything. All right, so, so we get this bigger moduli space, which is the critical locus of this function, or the derivative of this, the, this function. Sorry, the zeros of the derivative of this function. All right, and the, modu the original moduli space is sat inside there, sort of sat inside the zero section of the total space of this vector bundle. But uh, the moduli space, the, this new moduli space can be much bigger. All right, and so here's a picture in the smooth case when everything's nice, when your original moduli space has the correct virtual dimension, it's cut out, that section of the vector bundle is transverse to the zero section. So M has the correct dimension, it's equal to the virtual dimension, it's cut out transversely by this section. Then what you find is, this is a picture of the zeros of that function, uh, they are just the zero section in the total space, so the whole of the original ambient space, and then the whole vector bundle, ah, that should be an e-dual, the whole vector bundle over the moduli space, all right? And so you can see the critical locus, it's where the zeros of the section, of the function, sorry, it's where the zeros of the function is singular, and that is just the moduli space. Okay, so, so in the good case, what you end up with here is another description of the moduli space as the zeros of a section of a vector bundle on a big ambient space. But it's a different, it's now the zeros of a, a co-vector, or maybe a vector if you're in the real situation. Okay, so we've expressed the moduli space as the critical locus of some function. All right, so that's important uh, for what we're gonna do. And in the complex setting, that means, you know, it's like some Chern si holomorphic chern simons functional or something, and we've seen our moduli space as having in the language of mathematicians, a symmetric perfect obstruction theory. Okay, so we've turned our moduli space, which looks like any old moduli space, into a moduli space which looks like um, some, uh, you know, Chern Simons type moduli space. All right, but there's a price to be paid, which is that when the moduli space has the wrong virtual dimension, or when it's singular, when it's not cut out transversely, then this new moduli space is bigger. And in fact, it's a cone over the old moduli space. And the fiber, so what it is, it's some vibration over the old moduli space. Maybe the fibers jump in dimension, but in nice situations, the fiber is the dual of the obstruction bundle over the moduli space. So the obstruction bundle is the, the co-kernel. It's, it's the nastiness, right? It's the, uh, it's the thing in the implicit function theorem. It's the co-kernel of the derivative of the uh, original equations cutting out the moduli space. Okay, so that's called the obstruction space, and then it's dual fibers over the moduli space, and that's what your new moduli space is. So it's non-compact, it's bigger, but it has this property, it's the critical locus of a function, at least locally. All right, so I don't even know how to really make sense of this very well in the real setting, but in the complex setting, it's very easy to make sense of this. So it's spec of the symmetric algebra on the obstruction chief. Okay, uh, and, but what it does have, is, so it's non-compact, but it does have a C-star action, because if you remember, I'm working on, um, the fibers are linear, they were the, the total space of my original vector bundle. So I have this C-star action, or R-star action in the real case, and the fixed locus is the zero section of this cone, and it's the original moduli space, all right? All right, and here's the local calculation, my section, cutting out my original moduli space locally, I trivialize everything, it just becomes a bunch of functions cutting out my moduli space. Then the, the, the function I create out of it is just given in this form. I trivialize my bundles, so with a basis of sections of E, so that gives me this basis of linear functionals on E dual called YI, they're the coordinates up the fiber. I take its derivative and I see where it is zero. It's zero where the original sections are zero, so that's the original moduli space. In fact, it's inverse image, the whole E dual sat over it. 
that's here. And then it's, we also need this piece to be zero, and that just says that the, um, the points in the fiber has to, have to be perpendicular to the, uh, grade, the image of the gradient of these functions, f or s. All right, which says that y is in the dual of the obstruction bundle. Okay, so that, that's just, I'm just stating what I already told you. Okay, so just to repeat, in the good case, where the original section was transverse and M was smooth with the correct dimension, then the obstruction bundle vanishes and the moduli space doesn't change. It doesn't get any bigger, but something does happen. It's obstruction, it now has an obstruction bundle. The original moduli space did not, but now we do. And that's what you'd expect because we've turned this moduli space into some churn simons type moduli space. It's now cut out. It's now the critical locus of a function, so it has virtual dimension zero. It ought to be a finite number of points, and it isn't, so it, that's soaked up by having a, a big obstruction bundle. And the obstruction bundle is the cotangent bundle of the moduli space. You can work that out. That's very easy. That just comes down to this critical points of a function um, viewpoint. And so because of that, there's a natural invariant. So whenever you have an obstruction bundle, the obvious thing to do is try and take its top churn class or Euler class. So you take the Euler class of this obstruction bundle, and up to sign, this sign will appear throughout. Um, up to sign, you get the Euler characteristic, the topological Euler characteristic of the moduli space. All right, and so that's, <coughs> this is a way of instead, instead of getting uh, invariants on your moduli space by integrating cohomology classes, you can try and get some kind of Euler characteristic. Okay, but that's only in the good situation, and it's not clear what to do in the bad situation. Okay, but let's see what, what happens in our model case of the anti-self-dual equations. Uh, there are these waffer witten equations, and they're just a non-linear version of everything I've just said so far. So what you do is you take the old equations, so the anti-self-dual equations come from here, connections, which are modeled on one forms, and they go to self-dual two forms. This was the anti-self-dual equation. Okay? And then what we do is, so that, this is like the vector bundle E on my first slide, and what I do is I work on the, the total space of E dual. So I put in, but because uh, I'm in a real situation, I have a Hermitian, me sorry, a Riemannian metric and so forth, we can ignore all the duals. The duals are all for the complex situ holomorphic situation. Okay, so what I do is I take my equations and I add them into the unknowns. That was the working on the total space of E or E dual business. Okay, and then there's also a gauge piece here and here. All right? So, so this is very much like what I did on my first and second slides. And in fact, if you cross these two nonlinear terms out, there's B squared and B gamma, you would get precisely what I had on my first slide. Okay, so this is the, um, with, without these two terms, this is the derivative, this equation is the derivative of um, the function associated to the, the original section, the self-dual part of the curvature, this one. All right, but the waffer witten equations are nonlinear, and they're of this form. Uh, so you're supposed to notice that the unknowns and the equations are more or less the same space, especially once you fix gauge or divide by gauge. And uh, so it, it all fits into the picture I've been discussing. This is the gauge fixing equation. All right, but so what we have is we have some curvature equation, and then we have some equation for the fields. Um, so there are the, the self-dual two form and this scalar. And Waffer and Witten proved a vanishing theorem in good cases. So whenever you have positive curvature or um, in the complex case, which I'm going to get onto, you have negative canonical bundle. They showed that the fields vanish and everything reduces to the good case that I discussed before. The obstruction bundle vanishes. We get the same moduli space as we started with, but we see it as the critical points of a function. Okay, and so the invariant is now obviously the Euler characteristic of this moduli space. There's a natural invariant in this setting. Again, up to this sign, which I'll come back to. And then Waffer and Witten um, predict that this, the generating functions of these guys should be modular forms. And uh, they indeed show that that is the case in many cases. And there's been a lot of work in, the case, in these good cases. So whenever the canonical bundle is essentially negative or zero, there's um, a, a lot of calculations supporting this, this conjecture that you should get modular forms. 
And there's a, an awful lot of work in the physics literature recently with a six-dimensional version of that, which I'll briefly, which you'll sort of see emerge from what I'm going to talk about. Okay, but we, when you're in, not in the good situation, there's currently no mathematical definition. Right, so let's move to the holomorphic case. So from now on, I'm going to work on a projective surface. Um, this should work on a Kähler surface too, but um, people haven't proved the right Hitchin Kobayashi correspondence yet. And so the equations become this. We have a connection whose d bar squared is zero, so it defines a holomorphic structure on the bundle. Um, there's some equation which turns out to be a moment map, and then there's a field which is holomorphic. It's a holomorphic two-form, so values in the canonical bundle. All right, and we see this is the quadratic term from before, but we can see it as a moment map, so we can actually solve it by enlarging the gauge group. So by this usual kempf nest thing of replacing um, a compact group by its complexification and so forth. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to try and describe that now. You either know it or you don't, but this is the upshot. There's a Hitchin Kobayashi correspondence, so we can solve that moment map equation, do, do, do away with it, modulo dividing by a bigger group. So instead of taking solutions of the Wafferuk Witten equations modulo unitary group, we take a holomorphic moduli space with a holomorphic description modulo a complex group. So modulo the holomorphic automorphisms. All right, so this is. This is what the Waffer Witten equation is reduced to on a projective surface, say, or a Kähler surface. They reduce to these kind of Higgs pairs. So you take a holomorphic bundle with a section, uh, an endomorphism valued in the zero two forms. Sorry, two zero forms. Uh, and it satisfies a stability condition, which is what allows you to solve this moment map equation. All right? Really, the, the Polystability. Throughout my talk, I'm going to um, not worry about the difference between stability and semi-stability at all. All right, so there's a slope. Um, the slope of F, the usual slope of uh, any subsheaf which is phi invariant, that's the important thing. So th this doesn't say that the bundle itself is stable because you only test with phi invariant subsheaves. And those subsheaves should have slope less than the slope of E. Okay. And slope is given by the usual formula. All right, so this is what solutions of waffer witten equations are. And so there's an obvious partial compactification now. Instead of working with just with bundles, you can work with coherent sheaves. So you can allow whatever um, small instantons or whatever. OK, so uh, we're going to do that from now on. So uh, but th this doesn't look like much, but it's um, massively linearized the problem. So um, at the expense of sort of you have to work with this nasty thing called a stack instead of the anti-self-dual moduli space. So um, th this is some philosophical mysterious comment. Maybe we can ignore it for a second and just look at this. Uh, so more or less what we were working with before was bundles or anti-self-dual connections or something. And then we, we enlarged the problem, and we ended up with this bigger moduli space. Okay. Well, here we do a similar thing, but we work with all holomorphic bundles, not, anti just, not just stable ones. So there's some moduli so-called stack of all holomorphic bundles. This is some very nasty geometric object. I mean, it just has big stabilizer groups. So, there, you know, points here m might be unstable. They might be unstable bundles. Therefore, they might have big automorphism group. So you don't get a nice space. You get a stack. OK, and sat over it, we have this bigger space of stable Higgs pairs. So even though E might have lots of automorphisms, the Higgs pair will not have any automorphisms because it's stable. Okay, so the the phi will the the automorphisms may be big, but the ones which stabilize phi are, are not. They'll just be the scalars. All right, and the fiber of this map here is is uh, the space of Higgs fields. So these are the Homs from these are these Higgs fields. These Homs from E to E with values in the canonical bundle. And if you notice by said duality, that's precisely the dual of the obstruction bundle. So, so if he's a sheaf, this is the correct thing to write. If he's a bundle, maybe this is more familiar. Um, so you can see this is exactly of the same form as before. I'm replacing a moduli space by a cone over it with dual obstruction theory. And indeed, if you start, I mean, all this is doing is instead of working with all connections, sorry, instead of working, say, with connections which are irreducible, I'm working with all connections. So I'm allowing connections with big stabilizer groups. All right. So more or less the same picture as before happens. 
And now there's no nonlinearity. There's no nonlinear equation or quadratic equation on this phi. That's all gone in the moment map, all right? But I've just enlarged the gauge group. So um, this actually fits. This is a finite dimensional version of the model I spoke about right at the beginning. All right, and if you're fancy, um, then uh, you can express all this in terms of derived algebraic geometry. So M tilde is more or less the, something called the minus one shifted cotangent bundle of the stack MS, or it's a, the open subset of that with them um, where the Higgs bundles are stable. Okay, and then you can do something further. You can turn these Higgs pairs by the usual spectral construction into sheaves on uh, the total space of the canonical bundle of the surface. So I'm sure this is familiar to many people here. So more or less what you do, and there's a fancy way of doing this, setting up an equivalence of categories, but in a down-to-earth setting, all we're doing here is we're saying, let's work on any fiber. So, so look, here's my surface here. Um, here's a fiber of its canonical bundle. On that fiber, what do you have? You have a bundle E and this uh, endomorphism phi. And all you do is you plot its eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues of phi take values in this line bundle, Ks. So you plot those. There's three of them in this picture, these three red points. And over each eigenvalue, you put the eigenspace, the corresponding eigenspace of phi. Okay? So the kernel of phi minus lambda, where lambda is the eigenvalue. And so generically, that gives you a line bundle on a surface, on some spectral surface covering my original surface. All right? So if I'm doing rank R, if I have a Witten theory, so I have rank R bundles on S, they correspond, to, they correspond to these sort of torsion sheaves which look like a line bundle on a spectral surface which is a degree R cover of my original surface. All right, well, that's good because we've expressed now everything in terms of a sheaf theory on a Calabi R threefold. This is a Calabi R threefold. And so um, here we go. Solutions of Vafo Witten are the same thing as certain torsion sheaves on a Calabi R threefold. And uh, that's good because we know what to do with sheaves on Calabi R threefolds. However, it turns out there'll be a problem with doing that, and so we'll need to know this. So what I've described up till now is essentially the UR um, Vafo Witten equations. If instead we're interested in SUR Vafo Witten equations, then we have the same picture, but there's a constraint. So what we should do is um, we should ask that the center of mass on each fiber, the center of mass, the average of those eigenvalues should be zero, right? So the, the trace of the Higgs field should be zero. So um, these three points here, this one, this one, and this one should add up to zero, appropriately weighted by the rank of the sheaf on those points. Okay, so they're, they're sheaves with sort of center of mass on each fiber zero, and then also the determinant of the um, pushdown of this sheaf, so the original bundle on S, should be fixed. I mean, really, if I'm doing proper SUR theory, it should be fixed and trivial, but I'm going to allow it to be fixed in some line bundle. Okay, so, so uh, Vafa Witten is the same as some compactly supported torsion sheaves on um, this Calabi R threefold. This has something called a perfect obstruction theory. That means we understand how to locally say it's cut out of a smooth ambient space by a section of a vector bundle. And it's also a symmetric obstruction theory. That, so that means that locally we can see it as the critical locus of a function. All right. And it's non-compact, but because all the sheaves are compactly supported, the Serre duality works fine. And the moduli space it's because X is non-compact, the moduli space is also non-compact. Sheaves can sort of wander off to infinity, but there's a C star action, okay? So scaling the Higgs field or scaling the, the fibers of the canonical bundle. And the C star action has a compact fixed locus. So there's this fixed locus, which is all the sheaves supported on the zero section S, but not scheme theoretically. So they might be supported on S. They re really might be bundles on S, so the original anti-self-dual moduli space, but they might also leak infinitesimally into the canonical bundle on S in the bad case. And so we can define an invariant by virtual localization. So just by using the virtual localization formula, we integrate over the C star fixed locus, one over the Euler class of the virtual normal bundle. All right, either you, you know what I'm doing here or not. But there's a, there's a way of localizing 
um, using the C star action. Okay, and the reason this isn't great, and this is only a preliminary definition, is it, it, it vanishes most of the time. Okay, so this is usually zero, either if you have holomorphic two forms, because then there's, um, your obstruction bundle has this sort of trivial piece in it, which means that its Euler class vanishes and uh, you get zero. Or even if you have holomorphic one forms, then um, the virtual normal bundle also has a trivial piece, and that makes the invariant vanish. Okay, so really we want to use the SUR theory. And um, so we want to fix the determinant of the bundle, and we want to take trace zero in the Higgs field. Or in terms of the sheaves, there's a description in terms of sheaves on X, which I gave you before. Okay, so um, th this is just for mathematicians. This is of no interest to physicists whatsoever. So, uh, but I want to do justice to the uh, misery of the last two months of my life of trying to sort this out. So, um, you need a, a perfect obstruction theory for this smaller moduli space. So, that really ought to be trivial by now. I've spent my life doing this kind of, you know, virtual cyclists like me do this all the time. It really ought to be very easy, I was quite, but it turns out it isn't. So. So um, this is just for um, myself, quite frankly. Uh, there, there's a, so at the level of deformations of obstructions, you get, there's an exact sequence. So I have deformations of this uh, torsion sheaf. They come in from two places. One is by deforming the Higgs field, and the other is by deforming the, the underlying bundle on the surface. Okay, and one could derive such a thing. And there's something much more general when you take higher order deformations to all orders over all bases. But this, to first order, this is what's going on. And what you want to do is you want to replace this by its trace-free part. You only want to take Higgs fields which are trace-free. And here you want to replace this by its trace-free part. You want to, want, want to take deformations of the underlying bundle on S which have fixed determinant. But, uh, you know, you don't just take the trace-free part of this. This is already trace-free, and uh, that would be the wrong thing to do. So you, you've got to do something here. And uh, it turns out to be really hard, unless you use derived algebraic geometry, which is not really my subject. Um, and I can't really use it honestly. So uh, what we do is we convert all the deformation theory of sheaves on this threefold, which we understood, back into deformation theory of, of Higgs pairs. And, you know, people know how to do that to first order, but to all orders and perfect obstruction theory and so on, it turns out no one knew how to do it, so it's a bit of a mess. Okay. But we do that. Okay, so it turns out to be much nastier than expected. You can't use something called truncated cotangent complexes because um, you're relating deformation theories of, you know, this M tilde and M and the fibers, and so tr truncated cotangent complexes don't sit in exact triangles. Um, you really have to use the full uh, nastiness of Illusi's books. Okay, or you can use derived algebraic geometry and then it's one line. You just say the words quasi-smooth and minus one shifted cotangent bundle. Um, however, to do that honestly, you, you have to, yeah. I, I, I'm not so comfortable with those words, so. Um, anyway, there is a fix. Wh whatever your preference, um, th there's a way of doing this and uh, we can ignore this problem. So uh, we end up with a definition of a, an SUR Waffer Witten invariant, which, which needn't be zero. Okay, so what we do is we take the moduli space of Higgs pairs, uh, where the determinant is fixed to be some line bundle, the trace of the Higgs field is zero. We take the C star fixed locus, that has a natural virtual cycle, it has a natural symmetric obstruction theory, everything's good. Uh, we use the localization formula to make a definition. All right, and this reduces the previous definition uh, when, when the surface has, when, when the surface has a very positive, uh, negative canonical bundle. So the cases that were studied before. Okay, and it's deformation invariant. If I deform S, so long as L deforms along for the ride, I get a deformation invariant. If L does not deform, um, then it is not deformation invariant. All right, and then very briefly, so that, that's, for a mathematician, that's what we like to do, make definitions. We made a definition. Okay, there's a rival definition. So this, this is an aside. We can also do this C star localization in a different way. So let me explain it in some sort of general setting. Suppose you have some complex 
moduli space, uh, n, which will later be m tilde. And suppose it carries a symmetric perfect obstruction theory, so it's locally the critical points of uh, some churn simons functional or something. Then it carries something called a constructible function, such that its virtual cycle, which has virtual dimension zero, it, the invariant you get is the Euler characteristic of this moduli space weighted by this constructible function. All right? So if you haven't seen this before, all you should remember is, all I'm saying is, the invariant of this moduli space here is its Euler characteristic as expected, but because of singularities, I mean, in the simplest possible case, you can imagine your moduli space might be two nice points. That would count as two. Now you deform the setup. You can imagine these two points coming together to a thickened point. You would expect that thickened point to count as two, but its Euler characteristic is only one. And so this constructible function is some kind of multiplicity function which assigns the value two to that point instead of one. All right? So, but Behrend de develops this entire theory which says that these invariants, in this case where your moduli space is the critical locus of a holomorphic function locally, these invariants are really given by Euler characteristics, just weighted by this, this multiplicity function. Okay? Uh, so this is a remarkable theory. I mean, virtual cycles should be global things, which you can't see locally, but here, this is something you can cut and paste. All right? And now, when, in our case, we want to apply this to a non-compact moduli space. So now the left-hand side doesn't make any sense because it's non-compact. I can't integrate over it. Uh, but the right-hand side I can take as a definition. All right? So I can take this weighted Euler characteristic, and then that also localizes, right? Because I have the C star action, and the, uh, this bare end function is invariant under the C star action. So all the free orbits and quasi-free orbits, I'm taking their Euler characteristic weighted by some constant, so I get zero, except for the fixed points. So what I get is I find that this um, bare end expression for the virtual cycle localizes to the fixed locus. So I take the Euler characteristic of the fixed locus weighted by this bare end function of the whole space restricted to the fixed locus. All right? And in general, this localization is different from the virtual localization I did before. If you're in a compact setting, like instead of doing sheaves on a, the canonical bundle of a surface, a local Calabi-Yau, you were doing sheaves on a global Calabi-Yau, then, um, and if by some miracle you had a C star action, which is impossible, but let's ignore that, uh, then, you know, you might take, you might localize in that compact setting to a bunch of these local contributions. And then they would all add up to the same thing, because the localization formula would tell you that they give you the global compact invariant. So, but individually, these localizations will be different. So we have two different ways of localizing. They give different answers. In some global setting, they'll add up to the same answer, but we don't have a global setting. All right? So this, is a, a, this gives you another way of defining the waffer witten invariant. So it's not entirely clear which one you should use. Yeah, yeah, in some sense, yeah. No, I can't, no. Uh, the question was, uh, in some sense, the difference between these two localizations comes from infinity, which is correct. And now there's a, just to confuse matters further, there's a third way of localizing called keem lee cosection localization. So because I have this C star action, that's by differentiating, I get a vector field on my moduli space. And what's a vector field? Well, remember the obstruction bundle of my moduli space is the cotangent bundle of the moduli space. So this vector field gives me a map from the obstruction bundle to the functions, okay? So it's not a section of the obstruction bundle, it's a cosection, it's dual to a section. All right, and just as with a section of the obstruction bundle, you would expect if it didn't vanish that your invariant was zero, and if it did vanish, you could localize everything to where it vanishes, because, you know, more or less your virtual cycle you could try and think of as being the Euler class of the obstruction bundle. Um, they develop a theory which does exactly this. They localize the, the, um, the virtual cycle in any setting where you have a, a cosection of the obstruction bundle. They localize the virtual cycle to the zeros of that cosection. Okay, so in this setting, we localize the, zero, uh, the, the um, virtual cycle to the zero locus of this vector field, which is just the usual C star fixed locus. Okay, so that gives me this localized virtual cycle. And so that gives me another invariant. Um, but fortunately, 
This chi Berend localization, the key Lehman localizations are the same. And they're also, amazingly, up to this sign again, which I actually tell you what the sign is here. But, um, up to this sign, they're just the topological Euler characteristic. Okay, so all that complication I put in, typical mathematician, all that complication I put in was completely unnecessary. And you can just work with topological Euler characteristics. <coughs> so that is one local, so, so there were these two alternative localizations, or maybe three, this topological one, they're all the same. All right. So here's one putative, did I say that right, uh, Waffer-Witten invariant. And here's the other one defined by virtual localization. This one has the advantage of being uh, deformation invariant. This one probably is not. In the abstract setting, it definitely isn't. Um, but this one's rather more computable. Okay. So uh, you, wonder, you wonder whether either of these are of use. Um, I don't know if maybe a physicist could tell me after if there's some good reason why Physics tells you to take one or the other. Uh, but anyway, we're, we're going to try and compute both and see what we get. OK, any questions? So that was the definition part. Yeah, wh why, why is the, the definition I gave an Im an integer. So this one's clearly an integer. Um, th this one, it's because the virtual dimension is zero. It, um, so the localization formula, it turns out you don't, you don't have any equivariant parameters. The only thing that contributes is the, um, yeah. I should say, of course, if, if my Higgs bundles are allowed to be semi-stable, then I'm going to get rational numbers and so on. I haven't done any of that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. But we, we use the chi function, the bigger space restricted. Yeah, I'm not really taking stable. I, throughout this, just for simplicity, so I'm not using any Kinsevich Soibelman uh, fancy stuff. So. Uh, Everything for now is just um, in the situation where maybe rank and degree are co-prime or something, so that semi-stable and stable are the same. Yeah. Of course, we need to redo all this in the semi-stable case as well, but we, we haven't done that. Okay, and you know, by now we should have done these calculations, but life intervened and uh, uh, we got too busy. So anyway, what, what we're calculating, so there are, there are two two types of component you should calculate on. So this is the original one that in the, in the KS negative case that people have done lots of calculations on where they get modular forms and so on. So you can, you can restrict to the locus where the Higgs field is zero and you just get back the old anti self dual moduli space. Um, but when the canonical bundle is positive, it, it will be singular, it'll have uh, too high a dimension. You really have to use some virtual cycle technology and calculate here. And then in the canonical bundle positive case, you get a whole new bunch of components as well. And this is where the, the Higgs field is nilpotent. So in the sheaf picture, the threefold sheaf picture, this is where instead of the sheaf being really pushed forward from the zero section, it leaks infinitesimally into the threefold. So the support is some non-reduced scheme theoretic support, which is um, set theoretically on the zero section, but it's not scheme theoretically on the zero section. Okay, and you get various nested Hilbert schemes. Okay, so let me give you an example just to see how it works. So in the case of rank two, you, you get this, um, your, your bundle, your fixed bundle, C star fixed bundle splits into weight spaces, and you have a Higgs field, which can't be zero, because that's an unstable bundle. So the Higgs field is going to have to be non-zero, so it's some map. It turns out from here to here. And these both have rank one, so they look like this. They're torsion free. They look like line bundles tensored with ideal sheaves of points or curves on, uh, sorry, points on... Uh, the original surface. So this is a surface description, not a threefold description. And then you have these inequalities. So uh, by stability, you need the degree of this guy is less than the degree of this guy, because this guy gives you, uh, because this is fixed by the Higgs field, it gives you a phi fixed subsheaf of E. So stability gives you this inequality. 
And then the existence of a map between them, a non-zero map between them, gives you this inequality. And so you can see in the case that people studied before where the canonical bundle is zero or less than zero, uh, there are no solutions to this, and all, all of these guys are unstable. But where the canonical bundle is positive, you get solutions of this form. So for instance, the first case to take is the quintic surface, where the canonical bundle is O1. And then you, you get solutions of this form here, where you're just taking pairs of ideal sheaves of points, so zero-dimensional subschemes on your surface, with a map between them, a non-zero map between them. So what that means is this zero-dimensional subscheme must sit inside this zero-dimensional subscheme, because this ideal sheaf must sit inside this ideal sheaf. All right, so you get nested Hilbert schemes. All right, so this is this nested Hilbert scheme here. Uh, where the, the lengths of the, the two pieces add up to the second Chern class of your Higgs sheaf. All right, so a further simplification. Um, another example is if you take Z1 to be completely empty, then you just get the ordinary Hilbert scheme. And in this case, I can re now this is smooth, and so I can really show you how the calculation goes. In general, it's more complicated. You have to do virtual calculations. Um, so in this case, but even this case, it turns out to be uh, sort of worth seeing. So here, the obstruction bundle turns out to be this vector bundle over the Hilbert scheme. So what does that mean? That means um, at a point of the Hilbert scheme, that's n points on the surface, you take the following rank n vector bundle, you take the canonical line bundle at those n points, and you add it up. All right? Take the direct sum of those n lines at those n points. Okay? That gives you a vector bundle over here, and you can make perfect sense of it as the points come together. And that's the obstruction sheaf, it turns out, in this setup. Okay? And now, so <coughs> I can co-section localize that. So I, I should say, whatever type of localization you've done from a non-compact to a compact moduli space, you now have something compact. So now you can use any localization you like, and you'll get the same answer. Whereas before, the localizations gave different answers, because you were in a non-compact setting, and there were problems at infinity. Here, you can localize however you like. So we've already localized to something compact. Now we can further localize by this co-section localization using a section of the canonical bundle of the surface. And you localize to this canonical divisor in the surface. So a section of the canonical bundle gives you one of these sort of Taubes curves. Okay? And so what you find is the virtual cycle is really the Hilbert scheme of points on the, this Taubes curve inside the um, Hilbert scheme of points on the surface. So. Uh, these particular contributions of Waffer Witten all come from various integrals over the symmetric, you know, the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on a curve, which is a smooth thing. We understand it very well. You can do all those integrals, all right? And there are many other examples where we can do all these integrals, but yet, you know, I'm probably the wrong person to do this, but personally, we haven't yet worked out a sum over all n and see whether we're getting modular forms in either, in either setup. But we will do. I mean, th these aren't. These aren't complicated functions that we get. And then the alternative localization, the chi kind of localization, or topological one, gives me something different, gives me Euler characteristics of these nested Hilbert schemes in this example. All right? And then you can take generating functions of those, and those are, you know, those I could sum. I, that's incorrect. Those I could look in a book um, at the exercise in Stanley and find that, you know, I can... Uh, you, you can easily localize down to skew partitions. I could even do that myself. And then uh, you can look up generating series of skew partitions. Incredibly, they're given by a really nice formula. Um, and uh, yeah, so you end, up with, you end up really, in this case, with modular forms. So it's, it's not entirely clear what the, until we've done all these calculations and finished them, it's not entirely clear. Yes? Yes, yeah, sorry, a rush, that's correct. Yeah, of course, I haven't really paid attention with how to normalize these generating functions and so on. I will get to that. Yeah, maybe that's relevant. Uh, right, so um, as I say, in the compact Calabi R threefold case, which is where there's lots of work by lots of physicists um, doing with papers called S-duality as well, they uh, count various torsion sheaves supported in surfaces in X. And, you know, in, in cases there where you can reduce, you can localize the calculation to various surfaces in your Calabi R threefold, then either localization, will, they may give different answers, but they will all add up to the same answer. 
which is also supposed to give a modular form. But it might be, you know, it makes some sense to investigate whether all the individual contributions are modular, um, and maybe they are in either case. I have no idea. It's, um, until we've done the calculations, I'm not entirely sure what's going on. Okay, and then a similar trick means you can also define the kapustin witten invariant for projective surfaces uh, using the recently developed theory of Joyce and Borisov uh, defining four-dimensional DT invariants. Uh, but that's for another day. Okay, thank you. More questions? I didn't quite catch it, but you said there was, with one of the localizations, you couldn't check modularity by summing over n? So just at the moment, yeah, we haven't done the sum yet. But um, you don't need to do the whole sum to test modularity if you, okay. you know, just from the theory of modular forms, if you know a couple of terms, you can check. If you know it's modular? No. You can check if it is modular by looking, you know, either looking at a basis of forms or there are tricks. I mean, if you know the weight and you know the congruent subgroup, you can check. But I don't know it's modular. No, you could. Uh, we'll I talk later. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. I agree. I, I, you're saying you, I can prove it's not modular in particular. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd rather not do that. If you could expand on this uh, issue at infinity, why, why is it difficult to see the difference between localizations, or the origin of it? I, I haven't really thought. So the question is, why, why are these two localizations different, and can you sort of investigate at infinity where the difference is coming from? Um, that's not clear, because the, you know, the, the natural way to compactify this thing is not kalabi out. There is no kalabi out compactification of the canonical bundle of a surface, and I think that's the problem. So. If I do compactify it, the, the virtual localization still makes perfect sense, but the, the chi localization no longer makes any sense. Maybe the keen lee localization might make some sense. I would have to think about it. I doubt it. Mm, maybe it does. What's the relation to physics? So I right. think this issue is exactly right. key okay. to, your, uh, to answering your question. Physics should tell you what happens at infinity in some sense. So, so physics tells you what happens in a compact Calabi hour, but doesn't also, I mean, this Waffer Witten equation, the original Waffer Witten paper had nothing to do with Calabi hour manifolds. So there they're kind of making some prediction about surfaces. <laughs> Essentially, what happens at infinity is, uh, is an issue of how you define your physical theory. Uh huh. So okay. it, it, I think it's pretty much the same question. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Any other question? Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, thank Richard again. <laughs> and we, we come back in five minutes.